Good evening everyone and um, I'd like to welcome you to a special HM MRI event this evening from the comfort of your home or wherever you're watching us online. I'm Stephen Smith, I'm a colorectal surgeon, I'm a researcher and I'm the current HMRI Early Career Researcher of the Year and it's um, my pleasure to be the MC tonight. Um, I'd like you to introduce you to some people who work to ensure I'm not kept too busy and who hopefully will identify a cure to ensure that I can retire early as well. Um, but before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I stand, the Awabakal and the Waramai people, and I'd like to pay my sincere respects to Elders past, present and emerging, both here and wherever you're viewing from. Thank you for joining us. I believe we have in excess of 1,200 people that have registered to join us tonight. Um, I believe over 90% of those registered are females, which can mean one thing, uh, is that the men are all watching The Bachelor. Um, but, but thanks for joining, and I believe there's a lot more that might catch up and, and join us a bit later on in the evening. So while COVID, that, that, that C word, that naughty C word, is still impacting our communities, um, we're doing our utmost to ensure the safety of our community. As you may be aware, this event was organised for early in the year. Um, we've put, postponed it to now, and we're ensuring that it happens uh, virtually, and we're also, also ensuring, if you look around the room, there's not many of us in here, and we're all practising social distancing in this room, um, like I'm sure you all are in the community. Tonight you'll hear from five of the team in our internationally renowned gastrointestinal research team. We're very lucky to have world-class research here at Carlson, particularly at the HMRI. Um, we're lucky to have this team that uh, is able to collaborate with scientists and researchers across Australia and around the world. And in fact, just before we um, came on this evening, we hosted another event, the launch of the Australian Centre of Research Excellence in Digestive Health right here in Newcastle in HMRI, so it's a great honour to have members of that team here to share with us tonight. Um, this is a fantastic development for Newcastle, highlights the work from people from the University of Newcastle and from HMRI, and they work in combination with a lot of people and collaboration with a lot of people around Australia um, and the world to um, bring you a, a world-class um, research institution. Tonight you'll hear from these researchers on the important work they're, they're undertaking um, and hopefully also you'll get to help uh, hear how they help people um, uh, live better and, and understand the complexities of gut health. We've allowed plenty of time for questions, so please send them through our um, Facebook chat or privately online and we'll endeavour to get to them as we can during the course uh, of this evening and if we don't get to those questions we'll um, get back to you and endeavour to answer as much as we can online after, after the event. So it brings me great pleasure to introduce our first two leading researchers. These two really represent um, the passionate and the vibrant future of both HMRI and our digestive um, health team. Miss Burns is in the very, very final stage of her in immunology and microbiology. Um, she's working in the Centre of Research Excellence in Digestive Health that I mentioned before. Her research aims to characterise immune interactions in the small intestine and circulation of patients with functional dyspepsia. Pretty long-winded people, and I'm sure Grace will explain more of that to us, particularly myself, surgeon, in words three syllables and dyspepsia is quite a complex word. I hope she'll endeavour to explain that for us. Looks at factors that might drive the symptoms which diminish patients' quality of life. She loves working in the area because she's fascinated by the relationship between the immune system and the microbiome of our gut. And understands how little we actually know about the mechanisms behind GI conditions, even though these affect a lot of people socially, economically, um, and, and uh, affect a lot of people around Australia. Grace wants to help make a difference in these people's lives. Following on from Grace, we're going to hear from Dr. Bridie Goggins, um, who is a postdoctoral researcher here at HMRI. She's also the great mind behind the HMRI Open Days incredibly popular poo room. If you've um, been to the Open Days, I'm sure you'll uh, have witnessed the fantastic poo room. Um, I became interested in gastroenterological research after watching a close family friend suffer from disease 
but did not fully understand what it was and why continuous surgeries were considered for this disease. So she's become interested in understanding the underlying causes of inflammatory bowel disease and, and potential treatments for this. She's working on demystifying our gastrointestinal symptom, uh, sorry, our gastrointestinal system, and she'll be sharing some of her work in inflammatory bowel disease. So tonight I just wanted to share a little bit about how our work is actually showing that these conditions are likely driven by dysregulation of the immune system of the gut. So to begin with, I just want to go over that the gastrointestinal tract runs from the mouth to the anus and includes a number of major organs and glands that are all involved in the primary functions of the gut, so digestion of food, reabsorption of nutrients and elimination of waste from the body. Um, the gut is also a major site of immune activity, and this is because it's constantly in contact with food and microbes. And we, when we talk about the gut immune system, we talk a lot about what we call gastrointestinal homeostasis, or the balance between the immune system, the microbes, and the gut function. And we know that when homeostasis is um, disrupted, this can lead to chronic abdominal symptoms, such as abdominal pain, bloating, diarrhea, and constipation. And if you have these symptoms recurrently, this could be indicative of an organic gastrointestinal condition or a functional gastrointestinal condition, FGI. And so organic conditions are those that have obvious inflammation tissue. We examine the lining of the gut using endoscopy or colonoscopy. And an example of this that you've probably heard of is inflammatory bowel disease or IBD, which Bridie's going to talk about soon. We then also, at the other end of the spectrum, have these FGIDs, where there's no obvious inflammation or tissue damage. So when we look at the lining of the gut, it looks perfectly normal, but patients are still reporting that they have symptoms. And probably the most well-known uh, functional gastrointestinal condition is the irritable bowel syndrome, or IBS. Um, so traditionally, we thought that FGIDs were basically conditions that were categorized by ongoing gastrointestinal symptoms, but there was no obvious structural or biochemical abnormalities. So they were all in the patient's head. However, um, our recent advances in this area have uh, seen us revise this definition where they're disorders of gut-brain interactions. And we're also starting to show that there's subtle inflammation. So it's not obvious but under the microscope, we can see changes in important cell populations. What's really interesting is that a recent study found that 42.7% of participants in a global study had symptoms that matched at least one functional disorder. And when you think about how high that prevalence is, and then you think that a lot of people tell me they've never heard of an FGID, you might wonder why that is. And it's likely due to stigma that's attached to these conditions. So if you have debilitating and embarrassing chronic gut symptoms, because let's face it, no one's comfortable talking about their poo, particularly if they think it's abnormal. Um, so as you can imagine, there's a relationship with mental health. So if you have a functional gastrointestinal disorder, the rates of anxiety and depression are higher in this population. There's also a significant impairment of quality of life. And this is not just losing days off work because you're sick. It's also lost productivity because there are extra um, so symptoms outside of the gut, such as chronic fatigue or sleep disturbances that are also associated with these conditions. And given that we don't know what causes these diseases, you can imagine there's significant social and economic loss in terms of having to always go to the doctor, see specialists and try a number of treatments. So we don't know what causes functional gastrointestinal disorders, but there is some evidence to suggest the microbiota is different in these patients. We also know that in a subset of people, they'll have acute gastroenteritis, and in the time that follows disease recovery, they'll develop something like IBS. It's possible for some patients, but it doesn't explain the total prevalence of these conditions. And Carrot's going to talk more about how diet might be implicated in these diseases, because we know that food is one of the one um, triggers for symptoms in patients. A lot of patients tell us that foods like wheat trigger their symptoms, but we don't know why this is. So functional dyslexia is um, where a lot of work falls. And this is an FGID that affects the upper gastrointestinal tract, particularly the stomach and the small intestine. Um, based on subtypes of the symptom profiles. So there's the epigastric pain syndrome, and this encompasses pain and burning in the epigastric region or around the upper sternum of the um, torso. And the postprandial distress syndrome, which encompasses meal associated symptoms, such as feeling full after consuming a regular sized meal or not being able to feed a regular sized meal. 
What's really interesting is that it's quite prevalent in the Newcastle and Gosford areas. So our team conducted a study a few years ago and we served over four and a half thousand adults in Newcastle and the Gosford electorates. And we found that 16.2% of those patient, of those participants met the criteria for a diagnosis of functional dyspepsia. And then in the lower gut, we have irritable syndrome or IBS. And this affects the large intestine. Consider to be characterized by chronic and recurrent abdominal pain, along with altered bowel habits, but there's no inflammation when we look at the gut itself. And so we classify this based on stool profiles. So diarrhea um, accounts for nearly half of all patients with IBS. So di diarrhea is their predominant bowel habit, but there's also those where they're constipation predominant and some where they have alternating diarrhea and constipation. Uh, we also know there's significant overlap between FGIDs and organic conditions such as IBD, but we're not really sure why this is or what that relationship is. What's really interesting as well is that if you have more than one functional gastrointestinal disorder, so if you have both FD and IBS, you are likely to report that your symptoms are more severe than someone who just has one or the other. And then in the same study I mentioned before, we found that 12.9% of adults from the Newcastle and Gosford area had symptoms consistent with IBS. And you might say, well, if they're so prevalent, why aren't we just treating them and getting on with it? And that's because we don't really know how to treat these patients. So they come in and they see their GP or a gastroenterologist, and they undergo a diagnostic workup where the primary aim is to exclude organic disease, such as IBD or celiac disease. And when they're diagnosed with a functional condition, there's no effective treatment that targets the cause of disease because we don't know what it is. So instead, these patients are usually treated to um, repeated treatment trial and failure cycles, where we're trying to manage the symptoms, but we're not actually getting at the root cause. And this is, as you can imagine, is incredibly frustrating for both patients and their family. So it's the overall aim of our work here in FGIDs to determine what the actual mechanisms are, how the immune system is activated in these conditions, and then we can um, identify targeted treatments and hopefully improve patient management to reduce the social and economic burdens of these conditions. And so to do this in the context of functional dyspepsia, we're really interested in a part of the small intestine called the duodenum. And this is the first part of the small intestine, so it's where the, the small intestine meets the stomach. And we're really interested here because this is a really large site of nutrient reabsorption once food passes through the stomach. There's also a really high um, number of the microbiota in this area. So it's the perfect environment for the immune system to heavily interact with food and bugs passing through the gut. And our work has been identifying um, along with collaborators around the world and other groups that there are particular cells that are increased in the gut of these patients compared to healthy people. And these are particularly the mast cells and the eosinophils. And you might have heard of these cells in the context of allergy and asthma. And that's because in allergy and asthma, these cells degranulate and release inflammatory mediators such as histamine. And it's the release of these products that then stimulates this, um, the uh, symptoms of an allergic response. And then T cells are involved in the specific response to what we call antigens or specific molecules that stimulate the immune system. And so our work is showing that these functional conditions might actually be subtle or micro-inflammation rather than overt inflammation which we see in organic conditions. And you can see here, this is just an example of a microscopic image of a biopsy from the small intestine of both a person without GI disease and an FD patient. And they don't look that different, and that's the problem with these diseases. So overall, with our work here, we're working along the, th the theory that microbes and digested food products in our gut are inappropriately activating the gastrointestinal immune system. And it's this activation of the immune system which we can probably target with therapies to improve the management of the symptoms for these patients. So to just summarize what I've spoken about today, functional gastrointestinal disorders are conditions where there are chronic and recurrent GI symptoms, but no obvious inflammation when you examine the gut. We know that functional dyspepsia is an example of a condition of the upper gastrointestinal tract, while IBS affects the lower gastrointestinal tract. We also know that the treatment and the management of these patients is really complicated because we just don't know what's going on in their immune system. 
However, our work is working to identify the involvement of the immune system. So we're characterizing specific signatures of immune cells. And we've seen that these seem to be similar to the immune signatures that are seen in asthma and allergy. So if we can identify these mechanisms, then we can hopefully improve diagnosis and allow for more specific treatment options with the aim of improving quality of life for the significant proportion of people that have these conditions. And I just wanted to thank everybody for their attention and acknowledge um, the fantastic team we work with both here in the Hunter, around Australia and around the world because this work isn't possible without everybody. Good evening everyone, my name is Dr Bridie Goggins and uh, Grace has given us a great overview of functional GI diseases and I'm going to be talking about our organic diseases or inflammatory bowel disease and also a bit about how our gut protects us, in particular one single cell type and what happens when things go wrong. So if we dive into our gut now, as uh, Grace was saying, the GI tract extends from the mouth all the way to the anus and if I just look at the lower half here, so we have our large intestine that's surrounding our small intestine. A bit confusing, we tell the kids in the poo room the small intestine is longer than the large intestine, but it's smaller in diameter. Large intestine is shorter, but larger in diameter. And essentially, our GI tract is just a giant tube. So it plays a really important role in absorption of our nutrients and then excretion of our waste products. If we then cut a cross section of that tube, it has multiple different layers. So there's muscular layers, and if we go all the way into the innermost layer, so if you notice the white section, that's where our food particles and waste products move through. And that little squiggly bit that you can see in your image, if I just zoom into that, that's actually one single cell layer. So there is one single cell layer that lines the entire GI tract from the mouth to the anus. And that's the only thing separating our outside world, so what we ingest, from our underlying tissue and bloodstream. So it plays a really, really important role in protecting us. It's part of our innate defense system, so innate meaning uh, non-specific, and it's sort of like our skin, so it forms a physical barrier. So as you can see down the bottom here, we've got, um, this is a, a diagram of our epithelial monolayer. So our epithelial monolayer, monolayer meaning single cell layer, and they just kind of look like a little row of bricks, really, and they provide a barrier. And how does it do, do that? It's a protective, and it's protective through different layers. Like an onion, it has layers. So uh, it does this, or plays this protective role through secretion of products, and it also plays a really important role in absorption of our nutrients. So I'll give you an overview of how uh, it does this or plays this protective role. So we have an outer mucus layer. And interestingly, in this outer mucus layer are resident microbes, which actually use uh, nutrients from our diet, so dietary fiber, to maintain this outer mucus layer. And in people that have imbalanced fiber diets uh, or imbalance in their diet, they can actually have degradation of this mucus layer. Um, so, and Kerith will be talking a little bit more about our diet, uh, but that's something to consider that it can affect your, um, your gut, gut barrier based on your diet. So under our outer mucus layer, we have our inner mucus layer. Uh, so both of these mucus layers are made up of a uh, gel-like substance. And essentially the outer mucus layer and inner mucus layer are uh, made of the same thing, but in a slightly different structure. So whilst the outer mucus layer can uh, allows for uh, microbes or bacteria to reside in it, the inner mucus layer doesn't. So it's microphobic, I guess you could call it. So it provides another barrier. And then under that, we have what's called the glycocalyx, which is just a long chain of carbohydrates. And it is also important for absorption of nutrients. So any kids that were in the poo room know the word enzymes. It secretes enzymes that help to break down our food into components that we can absorb more easily. And then we finally get to our epithelial monolayer. And it's joined together by these proteins called tight junctions. And they allow the cells to stick together and uh, allow passage of certain nutrients whilst keeping out the bad things, toxins and bacteria. So uh, our epithelial monolayer is what we call selectively permeable. So it allows the passage of certain nutrients and um, 
uh, protects us from harmful substances. And <clears throat> pretty much anything that we ingest can damage it. So our food, uh, any medications we take, and some microbes. So it's really important for us to maintain this barrier in order to maintain our healthy gut function. So given that our, our epithelium is in contact with so many different things from the outside world, it does inherently get damaged, but it has intrinsic rapid repair mechanisms in order to reseal this barrier. So see, here we have uh, an image of an intact monolayer like you just saw. Say we have some form of injury, a mechanical injury, and we lose some of those cells. That will allow the passage of bacteria through that monolayer and into our underlying tissue and bloodstream. And that's where we get a state of inflammation, which is what I'll talk about in a moment. But in order to reseal that barrier and stop that passage of, of toxins, the surrounding epithelial cells actually send signals to each other. So when they're in contact with each other, they're happy. When they lose each other, they sell, send signals across saying, we need to rejoin. And it's kind of this uh, Benjamin Button kind of situation where they're mature as they were, but they kind of go through a reverse maturity to migrate along. And they migrate in a caterpillar-like motion to achieve that. And then they, they uh, line up and uh, join each other and stop growing once they reach contact with each other. And this process is called restitution. And w us scientists argue that it, it's the most important part of uh, gut healing because it restores that barrier. So once that barrier is restored, you can't have passage of those harmful substances. Then following that, we need to repopulate the monolayer, which occurs through proliferation. So doubling of our cells and then differentiation or maturation, which uh, then returns it to a mature phenotype or a mature gut that then can secrete um, different substances and, and reform its, its full function. So <clears throat> what happens when things go wrong? Someone asked the important question, what even is a leaky gut? So I've kind of given you an in, a hint in the previous slides, but if you imagine the intact monolayer from before, versus what you're seeing now. <clears throat> so this is a leaky gut. Essentially, it's a gut that, has, um, the, that doesn't have its barrier function intact. So it allows the passage of those bacteria and harmful substances. And when that happens, you'll have a state of inflammation in your tissue. And inflammation causes tissue injury, which is associated with or what causes uh, those symptoms such as abdominal pain, diarrhea and bleeding. And when you have continuous cycles of inflammation, that's what you get. Uh, that's what we see in uh, diseases such as inflammatory bowel disease. So our inflammatory bowel diseases are chronic inflammatory diseases that affect the lining of our GI tract. The two most common forms are ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. And I'm about to show you some images. So for those of you who are a bit squeamish, there is some graphic images coming, but I just wanted to include them because people suffering with IBD tend to look healthy on the outside, but I wanted to show you just how sick they can be on the inside. So here we have an image of a healthy gut. As you can see, it's got really nice vessels in it. It's got really smooth muscular ridges in it. If you then compare that to an ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease gut, you can see there's severe inflammation and tissue destruction, um, ulceration, and um, I'm sure you can all imagine if you have that inside you, you're gonna be in a fair bit of pain. So ulcerative colitis is confined to within the colon itself and its uh, inflammation is continuous, whereas Crohn's disease can actually affect any area of the gastrointestinal tract, so from the mouth all the way to the anus, and its inflammation can be patchy, so what we call skip lesions. And we don't actually know what causes IBD. We know that there's a number of risk factors that are associated with it. So environmental factors such as geographic location um, and diet, uh, we know that our immune response plays a role, so in people suffering from IBD, they, their immune system can be a bit exaggerated. They can have odd autoimmunity or uh, can release uh, chemicals known as cytokines that affect our cell function. Our intestinal microbiota, uh, which is something that Simon and Nick will be talking about after, after I talk, um, which can be influenced by our diet, our antibiotics, um, the, our, if you're a vaginal or caesarean birth or if you're breast or bottle fed. 
And there is also genetic susceptibility. So we know that there's a family history associated um, with IBD risk, uh, ethnic groups, and we can have a slight uh, genetic code hints. So what we call single nuclear polymorphisms or SNPs. And combined, the, the current consensus of what IBD is caused by is environmental factors precipitate an inflammatory response to the intestinal microflora in a genetically susceptible host. And unfortunately, we have no current treatment for IBD. Uh, the current treatments are anti-inflammatories such as steroids and antibiologicals and the main goal at the moment is to uh, target that inflammation and reduce it. So we try and get the patients into a state of remission from their inflammatory episodes. Unfortunately, the current treatments have some severe side effects and they're not always guaranteed to work. So some patients don't respond to the current treatments. And ultimately, these treatments are suboptimal not only because of the side effects, uh, but uh, approximately 70% of patients will require surgical intervention to remove severely damaged tissue. Uh, so essentially, we really need more comprehensive therapies to target some of the underlying causes of disease, such as a leaky gut. And that's where our research comes into it. So we're looking at uh, pharmaceuticals that can restore our gut function. So IBD patients do suffer from a leaky gut and essentially our uh, medications or our pharmaceuticals that we're researching uh, target cellular mechanisms that restore so those outer mucus layers and uh, those tight junction proteins to uh, reseal that barrier to make sure that it's uh, functioning as a, a, a functional barrier rather than a leaky gut. Uh, in addition to that, uh, our pharmaceuticals, uh, the research that we're doing has shown that it can actually accelerate mucosal healing. So those um, cells that are migrating to restore that barrier, we're actually able to speed this process up, which is again something that you want to stop in IBD patients having that cyclic inflammation. So if we can restore that barrier, then we're going to stop um, the, the influx of harmful substances and that inflammation. And it's been really exciting. So mucosal healing is the clinical goal for new IBD therapies. And it has, uh, the therapies we're looking at have had promising results in early stage clinical trials. So for anyone that's listening at the moment that does suffer from IBD, there is hope. Um, and that's all for me this evening. I just wanna thank our GI research group and the CRE and HMRI for having us this evening. Thank you very much. Wow, that, uh, that was truly awesome. Thank you to Grace and Bridey for those great presentations and hopefully you learnt a lot from that. In our next segment, we're going to try and answer the questions you've previously sent in to us online as best we can. And I think we're gonna be able to do a pretty good job of that because we've got two of the world's leading experts for you on gut health. Um, Laureate Professor Nick Talley um, is, is a true expert in this area. The name Nick Talley is synonymous with gut health. His work has transformed the way that we view the gut, the gut brain axis. As a clinician researcher, Nick takes what he learns from the clinic and applies it to research, and then takes what he learns from research and applies it to the clinic. He's made an extraordinary contribution to our understanding of gut health and continues to be a researcher in this field. For Nick, it all started with a girlfriend who developed an unexplained gut disorder way back when he was a junior doctor. He wanted to know why and how. So as a junior registrar in rotation at Bankstown Hospital, he was fortunate enough to have one of his bosses invite him to his endoscopy list to learn how to scope. And from that point onwards, Nick was hooked. A year later, he was introduced to a prominent professor who was looking for a young, keen doctor to do a PhD in. You guess what? Unexplained gut disease. So he jumped at the chance with additional training in gastroenterology and he's never looked back. Thank you, Nick. Tonight, Nick will be in conversation with Professor Simon Keeley, who leads uh, a research team that focuses on the role that inflammation plays in GI conditions, some of which you heard before in the previous two talks. Simon is co-lead of the Centre of Research Excellence in Gastrointestinal Disease. His passion began after realising he wasn't good enough to be either a professional footballer or a rock star. 
However, he was fortunate enough to meet some really great scientists while studying at uni early on that were passionate about gut research, that had enthusiasm for gut research, and that enthusiasm was infectious and it caught on with, with Simon. And they were amazing mentors and, and started him on his journey of um, gut research. Simon understands that gut health may not be a great dinner conversation starter, but he's fascinated to understand how our gut works and the complexity of it. Although he realises it's so complex he might not fully understand it, or we might not f fully understand it during the course of his lifetime. I'm sure all of you will find this a uh, informative and interesting conversation, and I'd like you to thank you, I'd like you to join me in thanking in the audience Nick and Simon, and I'll pass it over to you, and I'll lead off with some of the questions that you've asked us to answer. So, thank you very much um, for the opportunity to, to actually talk to the community. I think this is a, a really great um, interaction that's been set up by HMRI, and it's something that uh, the CRE. Is, uh, is very important for the CRE. And look, it's thrilling to be here talking about my favourite topic, the gut and gut health. Believe it or not, while it's not a common dinner conversation, when you get it going, people don't stop. They keep on talking about it because everybody knows somebody with a gut health problem if they haven't got one themselves. So look, it's a great topic and it's really a pleasure to try and answer your questions and a pleasure too to be investigating this common area and looking for new diagnostic tests, new treatments. Thanks guys. I, I guess we'll start off with a, a baseline question that was asked by a lot of people. What constitutes normal gut function? So there's no global, uh, uh, I guess, definition of normal gut function. It's actually really an individual process. So whatever you would normally experience is, is actually normal for you. What you really need to look out for is when your own change. So if you start going to the bathroom more or less, or there's a change in the, the consistency or the color of your poo, um, that's really when you start to think, okay, something has changed. But if you survey a hundred different people, their bowel movements and, and the way they, they uh, go to the bathroom, it'll all be different. Look, you know, your gut's there to digest food and to remove uh, material that's not helpful for the body. That's basically what the gut does. But the gut's full of nerves and muscles that are intimately connected and also the nerves connect intimately with the brain. So, you know, when you have a very pleasant meal, you feel pleasantly full after the meal, that's normal. If you feel really, really uncomfortable, soon after you eat, you might have functional dyspepsia. So it really depends. It's very much, you know, very much we will feel sensations that are quite normal, but then when things go awry, it changes. And people notice that very much. And to be honest, if your gut doesn't work, it really is a miserable time for you. Yeah, most of us will enjoy a meal and we'll, we'll enjoy thinking about a meal and we'll, we'll anticipate it well. And, and sometimes when, people have functional GI disorders and, and have digestive issues, they can't think, think about food in, in that way. So that's, I guess that's another way, and that affects you psychologically, that can affect your, your mental health, and you know, if you, if you can't find you can't enjoy the things you used to enjoy. But we also think gut inflammation may drive things in the brain directly, and so there's communication between the gut and the brain, and that is an area of active research that we're currently doing. Thanks guys. How can you tell if your gut bacteria is out of balance? <laughs> Simon. <laughs> oh, oh, well, yeah, so, so again, uh, it, it all really comes down to the poo, doesn't it? So um, the easiest way is to, to look at stool consistency. So our, our, our bacteria really, they, they live in our gut as, as kind of its own little ecosystem. So they're, they're like, you know, the, the food chain out in, in, in the wilderness. And they break down our food, they, they digest a lot of our food for us. And generally they live happily there and they, a healthy, a healthy normal microbiome will give us healthy and normal looking stool. If you start to see changes in colour or smell, it might be because certain bacteria there, they're overproducing gases, they're not breaking down foods and pigments in, in our food the way they should. So you might see it becomes a little green, it becomes a little red, it smells very sulfury. That's one way. 
Um, in the upper gut, so in some of the conditions um, that are associated with the upper part of our gut, the way in which the bacteria digest their food can, can emit a gas, and I guess in the lower gut as well, so you might feel a bit more bloated, windy, or you might belch a little bit more. I mean, to be honest, the, the, the tests for looking at gut microbes, there are fancy tests that we do, they're, they're research tests predominantly. People sometimes search on the internet for tests they can have done by companies commercially. They are available. They're not very good. I don't recommend them. I don't think they're going to help you very much in terms of sorting out whether you've got a microbe problem leading to your gut issues. And we're still learning a lot about the, the very specific area of gut microbes and gut disease. There's a lot to learn still. I guess, I guess the big issue is that we know the names of bacteria, and that's really where, where we, at, we are at with the micro microbiome. We can name the bacteria that live in each individual. But we're still not at the area of, or stage of research where we actually know what that means or what they do. And that's one of the things that we're actually interested in looking at in, at HMRI. So following on from that, uh, are microbiome and gut bacteria the same thing? No, not really. I mean, uh, the microbiome refers to the, uh, the group of organisms. It's not just bacteria. There are viruses and fungi and, and other things. The group of organisms that live in and on us. We are only partially human. We have an enormous number of microbes. The genes of those microbes outnumber our own human genes by a very large amount. Even the number of microbial cells out, you know, outnumbers our total human cell count. We are partially human and partially microbe. That is healthy, normal. So the microbiomes are the, the whole picture, I guess. And that's a little bit different to uh, what sometimes people think about. I guess when you think about microbiome, it's really about the genetic signature of the bacteria that live in our gut. So, so every organism on the planet has a little recipe book of genetic code which tells you what the organism is and what it does. When you look at that entire collection of bacteria in our gut and their recipe books, that's the microbiome. It doesn't actually refer to what the bacteria do, how they live, what specific function they have in our gut. So. People tend to use microbiome and microbiota or gut bacteria interchangeably, but there are subtle differences. There is an interest in lying on fecal transplants. Well, well, what a pleasant where topic. To? <laughs> <laughs> fecal transplants. No, no, but where are we up to in Australia with the availability of so they are available actually. I mean, gastroenterologists will offer this to patients, for example, with severe uh, Clostridium difficile uh, induced diarrhea, which is a very specific infectious diarrhea that sometimes doesn't respond to standard antibiotic therapy and you need to use something else. And to be honest, the faecal transplant works very well in that condition, although we don't exactly know why or, or how. So that's one of the issues with its use. In terms of other diseases, it's really experimental. There's been some work in ulcerative colitis, one of the inflammatory bowel diseases, and faecal transplants do provide some benefit uh, over and above uh, comparison treatments, but the benefit is only in about one in four individuals with disease, and so it's still experimental. The other diseases people sometimes use faecal transplants for really are experimental. Um, and uh, to be honest, we don't know all the long-term consequences of faecal transplant. It is human material being, well, presumably you're using human material, being moved from one person to another, really. And so there is risk and you've got to screen the people donating their stool very, very carefully. And there, is a, there are stool banks that uh, uh, provides material for people to be able to use in clinical uh, practice where required. So I think at this stage, it's very much uh, a treatment looking for uh, an indication uh, in many cases. And uh, I don't recommend it generally, uh, but obviously there are some very specific examples where it can be useful. I think if, if there are people watching without chronic GI diseases, 
they might be wondering, you know, why would you, why would you take a fecal transplant? You know, that, that sounds awful. But the reality is it shows how severe these conditions are. Um, so inflammatory bowel disease and, and even IBS um, uh, and FD, where people are willing to, to, to try something as gross as a fecal transplant if they think it might be effective. The problem is, is that there's still not a whole lot of good data out there on how effective this is. And, and we don't really understand how it works. And we've seen case studies where, um, for instance, obesity has been passed on through a faecal transplant, or at least that's what we think has happened. Somebody who has, uh, has received a faecal transplant from an obese donor has rapidly gained weight. So it, it just goes to show how little we actually know about the microbiome and how it interacts with our body. So it, it's probably not something to try without you know, a little bit more information unless it's an indicated treatment. I mean, it's technically very easy. I mean, you know, there are even home remedies for this. I don't recommend any of that. Um, but, you know, basically, as a gastroenterologist, we'll put a colonoscope up somebody uh, into the large bowel, and then we can squirt the stool from the donor into the uh, recipient, and that's how, how you do it. It's actually very straightforward. But, but you've got risk, you must screen the donor, there's lots of issues around this, so very much uh, caution please in terms of this uh, treatment approach. So it's interesting Simon you mentioned there how the bacteria can potentially affect obesity and Grace touched on this um, a little bit in her talk but how does gut bacteria influence the brain? This is, this is really an emerging area. It's actually a really exciting topic and, and, and the straightforward answer is we don't really know. But as we understand more about the gut, we know that there are, there are a number of pathways in which the gut directly interacts with the brain. So um, we have nerves in our gut that help us sense the environment in our gut and, and that's really to control diet, so to tell us when we're full, to tell us when we're hungry, um, to sense uh, pain or, or discomfort as well. Um, there's also hormonal um, um, regulation, so we now understand that many of the hormones that help um, control our stress response, fight or flight, also have action on the cells in our gut, including the epithelial cells that Bridie talked about. And I think, you know, if, if anyone's ever had butterflies in the stomach or, uh, or, you know, or felt very nervous and all of a sudden they've, they've had to use the bathroom, you, you know, you can appreciate how, how there's a direct link between how you feel and, uh, and your digestive function. So we think that, that the bacteria that live in our gut may be sensed or interact directly with some of these pathways. In a, in, in a normal condition, so in a, in a healthy individual, they may even help uh, contribute to keeping things in balance. So uh, keeping our gut functioning the way it is and then when things change in there and, and the, the signal is gone, um, then you get disruption, then you get a, a, a differential feeling. So some of the neurotransmitters, so the chemicals that help our brain work, are actually secreted by the bacteria that live in our gut. So you might be losing a signal from the bacteria that make you feel good or rewarded after eating. And if you alter the bacteria, you might lose that. But again, we still don't know. And I mean, there's some evidence that, uh, and we know, in fact, there's good evidence now that some people with these chronic gut symptoms seem to get their, their gut problems first and then they get anxiety or depression or other brain, if you like, symptoms driven by the gut disease. And there are others who seem to first develop anxiety, depression, other similar features, and then their gut goes wrong. So there's probably a part, there's probably two different pathways, two different sets of mechanisms and causes, but they lead to the same symptom outcome. So it's a very complex area, but fascinating, and perhaps we'll have treatment for brain disorders through working at the gut level. So taking that back a step, Nick, how does your gut become hypersensitive? Well, no, nobody knows. Hypersensitivity is very, very common for people who get chronic gut symptoms. So if you feel very uncomfortable after you eat, if you're, you feel very bloated or swollen, you've almost certainly got uh, intestinal hypersensitivity. Your gut is more sensitive when it's stretched by eating or by the movement of material or by the movement of gas in the gut, which is all normal. 
So it's very important, but we don't really understand directly what happens. But, but there is evidence if there's very low grade inflammation, the type of inflammation Grace talked about, for example, in the small intestine, that can lead to nerve damage and that nerve damage probably leads to hypersensitivity. So there's a relationship between the inflammation and the sensitivity, and if you can reverse the inflammation, perhaps you can improve the sensitivity. There is a possibility too that the way our, our microbiome interacts, our microbiota interacts with our food can maybe drive some of that in initial inflammation to begin with. So these bacteria break down a lot of the things we eat. So some of these sensitivities are meal related. So if your bacteria changes and perhaps can't break down food as well as another individual or as well as you used to, that might be where some of these, these conditions are triggered. So do we think therefore, do, do we think probiotics work? Do they have a role? Do they really work? Um, the evidence is very, very poor. Um, certainly in, in clinical studies where, where we do see effectiveness, the concentration of bacteria are orders of magnitude, so tens or hundreds fold the number of bacteria that you would see in the common remedies or the common formulations that you can buy in a pharmacy. So, so very few of the pharmacy grade, pharmacy grade uh, or, or over-the-counter uh, probiotics would match anything that we'd use in the clinic. And even then, the studies that have shown success, they haven't been very well designed, they haven't been very well controlled. So I think the jury is still out, but it's, it's not looking promising. And I think that's correct. I mean, a lot of the response to probiotics is what we call placebo, sugar pill responses, unfortunately. And, um, you know, there's all sorts of complexities with giving probiotics. These are supposed to be live bacteria in high concentrations, but they will often die off in the pharmacy mm. while you're waiting to sell them. And so they're not necessarily alive and not necessarily useful. Um, despite you uh, uh, buying them. So it, it's a bit of a problem. And I, I guess we do use them or, 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 or recommend them at times, but the benefit's usually small at best. If, if you go back to what we were talking about before about our, our gut being an environment and the bacteria that live there adapt to it, by the time they're taken out or you know, and, and turned into probiotics and, and, and put into a pill, it's been, those bacteria have been so long outside our gut that they probably can't adapt when they go back in again. So they're, they're not really good bacteria in the way that, you know, they can actually have a function in there and, and that's probably why they die off. So what damages our own gut bacteria? Well, look, we, we heard already some of the factors and they're very important. Diet changes your bacteria. If you change your diet, your microbiome is dramatically affected reasonably quickly, and I'm sure Kerith will talk about this later, but it is very important. Antibiotics, anyone who takes an antibiotic course changes their gut microbes, it may change that long term in some people, which may even be harmful. So that's a really important factor. Exercise potentially can change it. Any medication, almost, that's been studied has had some effect on gut bacteria. So that seems to be vitally important. So there's lots of, lots of different factors in our normal environment that changes the bacteria in our gut. And that change can be for good or make no difference or can harm. So it's very complicated. Yeah, and all of those things, and, and there's evidence too that lifestyle, so sedentary lifestyle and, and, and poor metabolism or hormonal changes can, can also directly affect the microbiome or mm -hmm. the microbiota that live in our gut and you know how that, that impacts our gut health, we're still not entirely sure. Yep. We, we hear a lot of benefits to developing your gut microbiome from vaginal birth and from breastfeeding. If, if you're a child that's been unlucky enough not to be, um, can you improve your microbiome later in life? Um, it's, it, this, is, this is a really interesting topic because I, I think sometimes it gets misportrayed, you know, when, when we talk about it in the community. So it is 
clear that people who are, are born by C-section or people who, um, who, who are breastfed um, or, or formula fed have different microbiomes. So, so breastfeeding and formula feeding have different micro, microbiomes. C-section and vaginal birth have different microbiomes. And when I say different microbiomes, the names of the bacteria that live in those people, uh, they're, they're different, different bacteria. But when you actually look at the function of those bacteria, how well they can break down proteins, how well they can break down carbohydrates, that isn't changed, at least in the studies where people have looked at that level. So it says, what it tells us is those things can impact the bacteria that live there, but not necessarily how they function. Now, what we don't know is if one group of bacteria, even though they function in the same way, if later on in life something can impact them that might drive you towards a gut disease. Certainly there's evidence that there's increased rates of allergy, um, asthma and GI conditions associated with C-section or associated with formula feeding. Um, but we don't really understand why that is. But it's not just as simple as the bacteria being different. There's, there's probably a second trigger or something else that's different. So, so the bottom line is don't worry about it. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's probably not as important as some have thought it may be um, previously. That's the summary. That's great news, thank you. I get this question a fair bit. How can you help your gut when your gallbladder has been removed? <laughs> well, um, you know, removing the gallbladder changes again potentially the gut microbes. Um, certainly some people get looser bowel motions, may get diarrhea after they've had their gallbladder out for various reasons, including the fact the bile is more continuously uh, put into the intestine and that can sometimes lead to secretion of fluid and that can cause diarrhea. So, so in that setting you, you need to provide, you need to treat that and there are ways to, to mop up the bile for example and to deal with, with that issue. But, but uh, overall if you have a, your gallbladder out there's nothing else to do um, uh, in terms of your gut health. Most people do great and they have no problems at all. Yes, certainly there are treatments out there that, that can help mop up the bile acids and, and they probably, they probably you know, are, are the best way to go forward. We don't, still really don't understand the role that, that bile acids and gallbladder play in the overall structure and function of our gut. You know, it, it's one of those areas of research that, that tends to go in and out of fashion. It was, it was really, really well researched about 90 years ago. And I think in the last, or not 90 years ago, in the 90s rather, um, and I think in the last two or three years, it's become very, very popular again. So. Great. Well, thank you both for your insights. I've, I've certainly learned a lot from, from that session, and uh, I'd like to thank everyone on for their very informative and intuitive questions. Um, thank, you for, thank you both very much. Thank you. For our final speaker of the night, and I think this is most appropriate, I'd like to introduce Dr. Kareth Duncanson. Kareth is a dietitian who's worked for 20 years in community nutrition and primary care dietetics before she ventured into research. While she loves supporting clients with functional gut problems to improve their quality of life, she feels fortunate to now bring this experience into the dynamic, challenging and rewarding field of digestive health research. As a senior research fellow in gastrointestinal nutrition at the University of Newcastle, Kareth focuses on understanding the relationship between what we eat and our gut health. Thanks very much, Kareth. Thanks so much for the opportunity to speak tonight and follow up on those excellent presentations and the Q&A session that we've already had. My job is to explain a little bit more about where food fits into the gut health and gut management picture. So as you've already heard, the primary purpose of our gastrointestinal system is to digest food. So our stomach is the mulching, mixing part of the digestive system, and then the nutrients are absorbed from that food in the small intestine. But it doesn't always go to plan. Something, sometimes things go wrong, and the nutrients in food trigger or exacerbate symptoms. So for example, in people with celiac disease, the gluten breaks down to gliadin and that's seen as foreign by the body and re results in an, in an immune response. 
in the carbohydrates in food are not well tolerated by people with IBS in some instances. So they're fermented by the gut bacteria and can cause symptoms in the lower part of our digestive system. And dietary fats can impact less directly. So when we eat fats, bile gets produced and if we overconsume fats, we sometimes notice that the next day in um, the form of a smelly floaty type of stool. Food also affects the gut indirectly by interacting with the bacteria in the mucus layer that Bridie mentioned earlier this evening. So there are carb loving bacteria, there are protein loving bacteria, and there are fat loving bacteria. And the abundance and diversity of the bacteria in our guts reflect what we eat by the way of those nutrients. And they then influence that protective mucosal lining through our whole digestive system. To have a gut bacteria that profile that's as balanced as possible, we wanna try and have a diet that's as high in all the different types of fiber as possible there's some evidence that omega-3 oils and phytochemicals are also beneficial for our gut bacteria. Processed foods and particularly emulsifiers may break down that mucosal lining and that's why they're shown here along with saturated fats and alcohol as being less helpful for our gut bacteria. Our team is doing some work on specific proteins and looking at how they interact with gut bacteria while other researchers are in investigating the impacts of fasting on what survives and thrives by way of the gut bacteria. As Simon's mentioned, there's been incredible progress in assessing the types and functions of gut bacteria ever since we've been able to look at the genetic information from those bacteria rather than having to extract them and reculture them to see what they are. If your gut gives you absolutely no grief, no pain, no constipation, no diarrhoea, no smelly or floaty or alarming coloured or explosive stools, then we would say your gut is normal. To maintain gut health, our goal is to reinforce and build up that mucosal membrane throughout the whole digestive tract and to keep things moving so that waste products don't hang around. On the other hand, to manage gut conditions, we may need to cut out foods that are known allergens for ourselves or triggers of symptoms. Either way, the goal is to have as much of the fibre, including the FODMAPs, as we can tolerate without getting symptoms. And that's true of all gut conditions, except in the very active or acute stages of things like flares with inflammatory bowel disease or diverticular. So fibres can be categorised by their solubility and fermentability. Um, the most soluble fibres include psyllium, which can be bought as the psyllium husk, which comes from a seed, or metamucil that you may be aware of that you can purchase. But soluble fibres also in, well, anything basically that expands with fluid, um, oats, legumes and the like. The least soluble fibres, our vegetable skins, wheat bran and husks, they're the ones that help to move things through your system um, more quickly and to prevent constipation, which in turn does reduce the risk of some of the gastrointestinal cancers. The fermentable carbohydrates are the FODMAPs, the part of wheat, onion and garlic some of the fruit and dairy sugars and sugar alcohols that many people don't tolerate so well. They've always been in food, we just haven't had a name for them up until the last 10 years. So if you have a functional gut condition, you might need some help in figuring out how much of those you can tolerate and importantly, how to build up your tolerance. You may tolerate the fluid drawing uh, fructose, lactose, sorbitol, mannitol, but not um, tolerate well the gas producing uh, wheat, onion and garlic fructan FODMAPs or vice versa. And your tolerance may vary depending on stress. If you've ever wondered why you can eat more bread and pasta when you go on holidays, it's more likely to be the holiday factor that the, the gut actually coping more with the FODMAPs when you're less stressed than anything different about the wheat itself. 
So to maintain or obtain gut health, we need enough of the insoluble fibre to keep things moving, which over time reduces that, that risk of digestive cancers, enough soluble fibre to absorb fluids and provide bulk for comfortable passing of poos, and then we need the prebiotic FODMAPs and resistant starches, which are the ideal nutrients for the optimal balance of gut bacteria. But what does that look like in, you, in your food and in your daily life? Each of these foods contains about three grams of fibre in the amount shown on the slide. That's about a tenth of what you need, minimum, for the whole day. Those fibre-rich prunes and pears, though, also contain sorbitol, and that draws fluid into the bowel, which is helpful for constipation, but not so good for those with IBS dominant, uh, diarrhea predominant IBS. The stems and skins of veggies in this slide provide mainly insoluble fibre, and you can see that we need much more spud for one serve if you remove the skin. It's still there, but not in the same amount. However, these types of insoluble fibres may not be tolerated well by someone with a flare-up of a bowel condition, like inflammatory bowel disease. One of the many conundrums of gut health research is things that prevent conditions, like insoluble fibre, can be problematic in acute flares. This means that people with gut conditions really need a good support team in place to cope with their conditions. It's really unreasonable to provide a person with a chronic digestive condition with a, a dietary handout and expect them to be able to follow, follow that when their symptoms vary and the condition um, provides varying amounts of symptoms and problems over time. These grainy fibres add both soluble and insoluble fibre. But for those with conditions like celiac disease, they have less choice and can struggle to get the a variety of fibre sources we need to achieve our daily goal. Wheat also presents one of our biggest challenges in research because it contains both gluten and the wheat fructans. So it impacts on um, the immune related celiac disease and irritable bowel syndrome. We are investigating which part of wheat people with functional dyspepsia react to in trials where we use an identical diet, but it's supplemented with one of the three muesli bars shown on the slide. They all look the same, but they contain different amounts of FODMAPs and gluten. In this study, we're monitoring dietary intake symptoms and objective markers from blood tests over about three months. So it's a really challenging trial to implement for both the participants and the researchers. As everyone has varying tolerances for healthy fibres, a dietitian's role is to match up how much you can tolerate while still managing your symptoms. And we need to help you to navigate the purchasing and packaging. For packaged foods, if fibre is not listed on the label, then it's not likely to be in there. So choose wisely. And remember that for food advertising, and it's product marketing, and it can be drawing a really long bow to associate a particular food with a gut healing property. Here are some examples of how to achieve that 30 grams of fibre every day. The top row is, example is so packed with colourful fibrous foods that there's enough room for supper to have a not so fibrous treat. The second row includes some examples of um, convenience fibre choices like a takeaway chia pudding in a cup for brekkie, which you can then use for your coffee at morning tea, a crunchy legume snack and a homemade date based bliss ball for supper. The rainbow of colours means a range of phytochemicals and the variety of grains means you are satisfying a wider range of the resident bacteria. Our new biobank will allow us to compare people's daily dietary intake with poo and saliva samples so we can better understand diet microbiome interactions. Eating live bacteria directly rather than cultivating them from scratch really seems like a great idea. But like with transplanting seedlings, if you're gardening, it doesn't always end well. Trying to boost certain types of bacterial strains really is like throwing a needle into a haystack or even a pin. Probiotic 
rich fermented foods are, re- are great for general well-being but wouldn't be the main focus of time, energy and money if you're trying to manage gut conditions. We need to know which of the strains are helpful, what else is in those probiotic foods, possibly some prebiotics as well, um, whether they survive the stomach acid, etc, etc. An area for much more research. It will be exciting. In summary, we've learnt, particularly from our colleagues at Monash University, that there's definitely a role for FODMAP manipulation in IBS. There may also be a role for FODMAPs in functional dyspepsia, but it's likely to also involve some immune responses, whereby food has a different role in the presentation. Individuals with functional gut disorders need to know which FODMAPs flare their symptoms, how much they can tolerate, and how to increase our tolerance possibly via that gut-brain axis we've been talking about this evening. We know that inflammatory bowel disease, the, the inflammatory response, responds to steroid treatment. But we would also like to know if food-based dietary alternatives can calm down flares in addition to or instead of the current enteral nutrition options. These conditions are really tricky to study because they're so diverse and also overlapping. Till now, the absence of more concrete diagnostic criteria, we've been working with patient reported symptoms, um, we've been working with patient reported dietary intake and measuring bacteria from the stool, not from the mucosa directly. So we really are entering a really exciting era of gut research where we can look at the abundance, diversity and functions of the mucosal microbiome current and recent dietary intake, and increasingly using objective diagnostic criteria for these so-called functional gastro disorders. It's complicated, it's challenging, but it's also really rewarding and really exciting. Our team really is trying to make sense of gut health through science. Our diverse team also includes pathologists, statisticians, psychologists, really talented PhD students um, who keep us on our toes, and supportive clinicians and research assistants to recruit into our studies. Because understanding gut, the gut is so complicated, we urge you to trust in research and the clinicians with gut health expertise. Thank you. And if we've motivated you tonight to get on board with our gut research, you are welcome to um, check out the Centre for Research Excellence in Digestive Health website. Um, We need people with gut conditions and healthy volunteers to join our studies. Thank you so much for joining us this evening and please stay on for our question and answer session. Well, thanks very much, Kareth. That's um, uh, a great way to, to end the formal part of the um, evening and I guess if I could summarise that in, in one sentence uh, dietitians were telling us 50 years ago that fibre was good for us um, and they're still telling us that fibre is good for us. I think we're slow learners um, but thank you very much and now we're going to start um, uh, a panel, an interactive panel that I'll be joining. There are uh, six of us I believe up on stage or is it five? five of us up on stage um, so if you have any questions um, just fire away on the Facebook um, feed or online and uh, we'll attempt to answer it to the best of our abilities we, we have a question here is red meat hard to digest and bad for your gut we talked a bit before about mechanical digestion so the really the most important thing with red meat is actually chewing Um, So we have to help the red meat to be digested. And the second part of the question was? Um, Is it bad for your gut? It is not bad for your gut. I mean, red meat is is a whole product. So if we're looking for a food that's high in protein, red meat's that, high in iron, it's that. So there's a whole range within red meat of how healthy something might be. And so if we're, we're talking about things like game meat, Um, Lean beef, lean lamb, absolutely not. They're also high in some of the omega-3 oils. Um, They're not high in fibre, so it's nice if we combine them with something that has some fibre in it too. Um, And where does acidity or stomach acid fit into the gut health picture? 
So look, you need gastric acid, stomach acid, to basically kill bacteria that may harm you from the foods and other things you eat and drink. So that's what acid does. Acid doesn't digest food. It just doesn't. So actually, if you block acid production or remove acid production, you can live a very healthy life, even though that acid protection is no longer there. So, so really, acid is important. Acid, if it's in excess, can cause some harm to the lining of the gut, uh, the stomach or the esophagus. But overall, reducing stomach acid with medications, for example, um, isn't going to put you at high risk of any major gut health problems, although any medication can have side effects. Um, and uh, can fasting be beneficial to gut health? Yes. <laughs> um, we, I, I touched on this earlier. Um, it, it's an interesting area and basically some of our gut bacteria survive better than others on lack of nutrients. So it is going to alter the gut bacterial profile, whether that necessarily means that all of the things that are going to you know, be helped by that environment is beneficial or not, we really don't know yet. Um, so I think the jury's still out on, on that one, um, although I wouldn't want to be a candidate in one of the studies. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you build up digestive enzyme levels? Um, I don't know the answer to that <laughs> one. Um, so, so generally, actually, uh, the way in which we digest uh, food is, is very tightly regulated. So uh, our bodies are obviously have evolved over the years to, to be able to take nutrients in, break them down, and, and or take foods in, break them down, and take the nutrients from them. So. Under normal circumstances, uh, no, we, we, we regulate them very well, so we can optimally digest. I suppose there are uh, conditions of, of uh, GI conditions where certain things which, that help break down or solubilize parts of our food, so bile acids, for instance, can be overproduced and that can affect um, digestion. So it, under normal, normal circumstances, no, but th there are probably conditions where We'd, we'd have some processes that would be, be different. We do, we do see, this see this with lactase, don't we? Um, oh yeah, of course. Um, where the, the, uh, the small intestine has a, a substance called lactase that breaks down lact lactose and um, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, you smarter medical doctors than I am, but um, uh, in certain societies lactase is present in higher proportions than, than in some other societies but we know that people that are continually exposed to lactose containing products like dairy products tend to build up the lactase level so that they can uh, they can dissolve that, that and absorb that product. And how does the gut influence mental health? I mean we're not it's it's like anything in this space um, particularly the functional GI disorders we don't fully understand we know that there's an association and we know that there's a link but we don't fully understand that total mechanism that's driving that. Um, we know that uh, if you have chronic GI symptoms, you're more likely to develop or um, have symptoms of anxiety and depression and, consequent, um, and vice versa. If you have uh, anxiety and depression, you're also more at risk of developing a functional gut disorder. So um, we, we, know, we know what's there, but we don't know how it's connected at this point, I think is where we're at. Look, I think, I think it's a really exciting area. The idea that gut disease may actually be a cause of mental health issues and potentially be treatable is an area I think that's really exciting and it's an area that, that uh, we plan to do more work in. And we don't know if, if, if that is the mechanism. We don't know if that's driven by bacterial signaling, although there's good evidence in some uh, animal models and other disease models that that may be the case. Um, and also the inflammation part of the uh, pathway may be relevant. So um, uh, watch this space, I guess. And just added to that in terms of lifestyle, you know, if people are really affected by a functional gut disorder and they can't get out of the house before 10 a.m. because they're sitting on the loo with diarrhea or they feel so bloated by the end of the day that they can't live their, their social 
life, then that, you know, it, it could also be the pain and it could be the social aspects of the conditions that impact on mental health as well. So it's, it's really complicated, but understandably quite challenging mentally. The, the real clincher for me has been, you know, the, the emerging evidence that gut bacteria can play a role in neurodegenerative disorders. So, I mean, there's great evidence, so Parkinson's disease, uh, there's some work in autism, so there's real evidence that the, the gut can actually play a role in, in gut to brain signaling. Mm. So we'll definitely be working on this. This is, a, this is a, an important area for us and an important area for health in Australia. Um, talking about the brain again, uh, train your brain to cure IBS. <laughs> um, I think the answer is possibly yes. I mean, there are some good clinical trials, quite well done clinical trials, that show, for example, that hypnotherapy can help people with these chronic functional gut symptoms. We don't know how hypnotherapy works, but presumably that is working through the brain. It is through retraining, if you like, our brain. And that certainly can suppress the gut uh, symptoms and uh, that also most likely has some relationship to changing the mechanisms in the gut although we don't really understand what they are so there is evidence for this um, uh, the problem with the, the, that kind of therapeutic intervention is it's actually not widely available for very many people um, and uh, you know it's not something that people are used to uh, organizing for their patients so there's some limitations in the system for providing this kind of care and some people don't want that kind of therapeutic approach although it can help uh, a number of people so it's worth considering as an option and it's a, a specific type of gut focused hypnotherapy um, that we're talking about in that situation. Um, from a food point of view, it's interesting because we usually talk about people eating mindfully and with functional gut disorders, we, we sometimes talk about them eating mindlessly because um, they focus too much on the impact that food might have on their digestive system and it's sort of, you know, hypersensitized even before they start a meal. So that's another type of training of the brain, I suppose, to manage gut conditions. It, it is something we're looking at in the CRE because um, some, some of our, our collaborators in Germany have worked on cognitive behavioral therapy and, and how that might influence uh, symptoms in, in functional GI disorders. And even um, there have been some studies to show that yoga and physical exercise can improve symptoms. And, and we're working with um, uh, exercise physiologists in, in Queensland uh, to, to investigate that, that area. Yeah. So, so, so in fact, this leads to the idea of a multidisciplinary approach to care of complex patients mm -hmm. with the, the, the difficult, the severe functional gut disorders, the ones where people are really incapacitated by their symptoms. And there are, unfortunately, some people in that boat. So, and there's evidence now, and, and we just had a recent publication on this, that a multidisciplinary team approach, looking at a number of, the, of those areas, from diet to, to uh, education, to brain interventions, simple things, um, can be very helpful. So that's the approach for the future. What test would you recommend for detecting IBD? I guess that's a clinical question, so I'll take it to begin with. Um, you know, normally we, we, we suspect inflammatory bowel disease based on the history and the exam, so we may well strongly suspect it. For example, there's gut bleeding, and that would suggest an inflammatory process, an obvious inflammatory process. And then we'll do some blood tests and possibly stool tests to look for causes and other evidence of inflammation. And if they're suspicious or we're clinically suspicious, we'll actually look into the gut. That's doing what's called a colonoscopy, for example, to look for evidence of inflammation, to take tissue samples, which is painless, and to make a diagnosis. And a diagnosis is important because it affects how we treat people, how we manage people long term. So it's not difficult to diagnose if you're suspicious of the diagnosis. How can you help digestion if your stomach acid has been destroyed? 
Well, I've almost said something about this already that, you know, stomach acid isn't relevant to digestion. So you shouldn't be too worried about that. You may have symptoms that you think are related to this, but it's unlikely to be the acid problem. It's more likely to be something else that's causing the symptoms that you have. So replacing stomach acid, we do not recommend. There's no therapeutic interventions to replace stomach acid at the present time. Um, and there's no need to do this uh, to the best of our knowledge. Can gut issues affect iron absorption? The short answer is yes. <laughs> um, so iron's absorbed in the small, upper small intestine. Um, if, for example, you get celiac disease, there's an inflammation in the small intestine, and you may not absorb iron, and you may be iron deficient and be anemic, and that may be what the reason is. But there are other reasons you may um, be iron deficient. You, it may not be absorption. It may be about losing iron. Um, either in, you know, from blood loss in the gut or blood loss somewhere else. So um, yeah, I, I, I think uh, um, there's a cl clearly, clearly, you know, there's an important relationship between how the intestine functions and how all your nutrients, all your vitamins are absorbed so the body can use them for healthy living. You may have news, Stephen, that you can yeah. tell me whether it is. Oh, yes, um, just on yes. That, that one, it's very, very important that iron deficiency or low iron is investigated for, for, most, for the most part because it is a sign of bowel cancer, a potential sign of bowel cancer and stomach ulcers and other conditions that Nick was alluding to. It's, it's quite rare in women that aren't menstruating heavily or those that aren't vegans to have iron deficiency for other causes, so it should be investigated. Yeah. Thank you. Um, that leads into this next question. Um, I had terminal bowel cancer diagnosis three years ago. How can I help myself stay healthy after surviving and getting the all clear so far? Well, that's a, a very good question. Um, I, I guess it would be quite individual, individually answered. Um, terminal bowel cancer, I guess, is a difficult diagnosis and I, I don't have to um, understand what was meant by that diagnosis of terminal bowel cancer if you've got the all clear. Um, but certainly everything that we've alluded to before helps with he healthy living, whether you have a healthy gut or whether you've had a lot of your gut removed surgically or whether you have um, problems with any form of cancer. Um, and healthy living, a lot of the aspects that Kareth touched on in terms of diet, um, exercise is vitally important, social interaction is extremely important. Um, and mindfulness and uh, alternative therapies to uh, help control it, uh, help with control of your mind and help with relaxation are extremely important um, and of course um, seeing your doctor and and, uh, and keeping an eye on things with your doctor and your, your local doctor and your specialist are, are vital as well in that sort of diagnosis and I guess the only other thing to say is the good news about bowel cancer is if you get it early, it's curable. It's really important to, to diagnose it early. And um, if you get a, an envelope in the, in the post from the government about having a, a test, mm -hmm. um, for goodness sake, please go and please do it because that is a very important way to detect bowel cancer early. And if we pick it up early, then we really can cure people most of the time. So please do the test. I've done it. If you get an envelope, please, please do it too. I think following on from that as well, just if you have chronic recurrent gastrointestinal symptoms, um, no matter how embarrassing you might find they are, it's nothing your GP hasn't seen before. And I think that that's something that we don't talk about enough um, and it's a bit taboo, but if something's not right and you know something's not right because no one knows your body better than you, please go and see your GP. And to reduce the stigma even further, <laughs> There are plenty of people suffering from gut dysfunction, IBD, IBS. So if you normalize that in the conversation, it will help those people to, to realize there might be something wrong or, or not feel embarrassed about it. Because yeah. we all tend to have gut function problems here and there. Um, and people that suffer from IBD can, can need to go to the toilet up to 20 times a day. So if you think about that, a lot of the time they'll go out for coffee or something and need to locate the toilet as the first step. 
So I guess part of this is all normalizing talking about gut function as well. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if there's a thousand people watching us tonight, then three or four hundred of them yeah. will have a chronic gut problem. Three or four hundred out of a thousand. That's a lot of people. Around 50% of them won't have actually seen a doctor about it. Correct. And, you know, there's nothing to be ashamed of. And, and by the way, if you're completely healthy, the only other problem is some of you will develop gut problems over time. So that's the other good news. But the best news is, in the future, I think we'll have even better treatments, better diagnostic tests to deal with these problems. So that's the good news. Um, we would like to thank you all for participating. We'd also like to thank our partners, the University of Newcastle, the Hunter New England Local Health District um, for joining uh, in with us tonight and supporting us in our work. And if there's some questions we haven't answered uh, that you've posted online, we'll endeavour to get back to you um, as soon as we can and we, with one of, our, one of our experts on this panel to, to try and answer your question. Of course, you can keep up to date with all our latest and greatest from HMRI, either via the website or, or via the social media outlets that HMRI is fantastic for uh, uh, keeping people up to date with. And if you'd like to support the life-changing research that happens here, um, please do so and please don't hesitate to get in touch either via um, those sources or directly um, over the phone. We'd love, we'd love to hear from you and um, we, we value your support. HMRI is really a community-based um, research institution that relies heavily on your support as Novocastrians, as uh, people of the Hunter uh, New England Health District. Our next exciting virtual seminar is on the 14th of October and it's Mental Health Week that week and uh, we have just uh, as incredible a range of speakers um, that uh, involved with mental health research and uh, they'll be here doing the same thing with you online because I presume COVID um, issues won't have changed a great deal by then, so I'm sure it'll still be online then. So um, we look forward to catching up with you again then and soon, um, either in person or virtually, and have a good night. Thank you very much for joining us.